Good morning, friends. Please grab your seat. Great to see all of you. If you're sitting in the air-conditioned wing of the base this morning, it means you're sitting outside the Buddha aircon. Welcome to the base. Sad I can't see you. I trust you can see me, but welcome. And I want to encourage you, if you're seated outside, the Spirit of God is not limited just to inside the building. It's limited to what you will open your heart to. So if you'll open your heart this morning, no matter where you are seated, you're so welcome here this morning. We have got plans to create space, or can I say God has got plans for us to create space? And uh, then it's going to be nice not to sit into your neighbor's armpits and actually have a bit of space uh, to enjoy the Lord together. Please open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I said 2 Corinthians 3, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 3. Let's read together. I want to encourage you, why, why do I make such a fuss about bringing your Bible? Some of you just think this oak is just, man, he's so arrogant, he's so full of himself. He thinks that he can call the shots. Friends, I want to tell you the technology we have in your hand is dangerous to receiving the word from the Lord. Please hear me. The kingdom, the secret of the kingdom, the secret of the kingdom is about hearing the word. Hearing the word and the soil of your heart. So please hear me. When you come to church, why are you coming? You're coming to hear the word, isn't it? Why? Because if you can hear the word, faith gets activated. Now what happens when you sit with your iPhone or your iPad trying to track the word and here Omar Granny sends you a WhatsApp? Ooh, in that moment, I have to attend to Omar Granny's needs. What has just happened in that moment? The word of the Lord just went past you and you're like, oh, okay. Technology interrupted the word that you had to receive this morning. So can we tone it down to basic, basic, hard copy, the word, the Bible, and a notebook? I know it's not fashionable to write anymore, but you do get fashionable notepads. And you can buy nice pens. Make an investment in how you hear the Lord. It'll change your life. Are we okay? Awesome. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with comfort we ourselves have received from God. For just as the sufferings of Christ overflow into our lives, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If you are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. And our hope for you is firm, because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, so also you share in our comfort. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about the hardships we suffered in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, in our hearts we felt the sentence of death. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Please underline in your Bible. The God that you trust in raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and He will deliver us. 
on Him, we have set our hope that He will continue to deliver us. As you help us by your prayers, then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor grant us in answer to the prayers of many. Verse 12 goes into some of the disputes that the church in Corinth had with Paul. He's in ability to plan and I've got issues with this, this leader the Lord has raised up and they're not happy with it because this, because that's starting to pick up on that issues. Paul, why don't you plan your life? He says, I'm doing my best. But I have to plan according to his will, not according to your needs. And then he picks up in verse 18 again. It says, but surely as God is faithful, our message to you is not yes and no. Well, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, was preached among you by me and Silas and Timothy. Sorry. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by me and Silas and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him it has always been yes. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. Please underline. No matter how many promises God has made, His promises are yes in Christ. And so through Him, the Amen spoken by us to the glory of God. Underline the word Amen. Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set His seal of ownership on us, and put His Spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. I call God as my witness that it was in order to spare you that I did not return to Corinth. Not that we lord it over your faith, but we work with you for your joy because it is by faith that you stand firm. And so as we come to your word this morning, Father, I ask that your word will search our hearts. I ask this morning that your word would, re- would, would reveal our hearts. And as we come to humble ourselves before you this morning, Father, that you will do imaginably more than what we could even ask or imagine this morning with your power. I pray this morning that blockages will be released, Father. I pray this morning that limitations will be exposed and will be, will be dealt with and done away with. I ask this morning, Holy Spirit, for fresh enabling to do the work of our Father. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. I want to talk to you about this morning about fighting the fight of faith, but I want to narrow your faith. I want to help you to fight the fight of faith in the Lord, in the Father of our God and Lord Jesus Christ. I want to help you to connect your faith to the reality of God as a Father. If I had to quickly ask you this morning, just for a moment, just close your eyes. Don't take Sunday morning nap. Just close your eyes. And just think, or just, just meditate on what comes to your heart, what comes to your mind if you think of a father. What comes to mind? Okay. Awesome. Who had difficulty to have any image of what a father meant? Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See, some of us never had a father, so when you talk about closing your eyes and picturing a father, it's like, okay, okay, you're leaving me hanging. Some of us this morning, who, who had an image of a father that was an image you'd rather forget? Please be honest. I'm not going to call you to the front. Wonderful. Thank you. Who this morning recalled an image of a father that you say, man, I miss his company so badly? There we go. Wow. Wonderful. Wonderful. This morning, I want to change your image of God as a father. See, Paul is in this passage, he's busy dealing with pressure and opposition in a place the Lord has called him to labor. And he's fighting this fight of faith, and he's standing on the promises of God, and he's doing all these things, but the resistance seems to be overwhelming. And here's something incredible about this passage. 
He's in the place that God has designed for him to function. He's in the province of Asia. He's incredibly fruitful. In two and a half years, they take the gospel to a whole province. It's like as a base going for two and a half years and reaching a whole thing. In the place of incredible productivity, there's this incredible pressure that's coming against him. Do you know why? Because the enemy is not happy. There's certain assignments for you to unlock your inheritance. The Lord is going to send you into places of incredible productivity and you're going to stand on the enemy's head and he's going to jolt and he's going to fight back and he's going to bite and he's going to see how can he get you to dwindle in your faith. The key I want to show you is how Paul kept fighting. How did he stand firm in his faith? You know how? He knew who his father was. He knew who his father was. He knew that he could just simply fight the fight of faith. And he knew who his father was. And so his faith took him to God as his father. And that kept him standing. You see, some of us, we can't get active in our faith because we don't even have an image of a father. God wants you, he wants to send your life into difficult territories where there's resistance, but you're not able to go, you're so afraid and intimidated to go because you do not know who God is as your father. There's an apostolic mandate on the base, if you've not discovered that yet. The Lord is raising up an army to go into the difficult places left over in the countries of the world. Do you know what's going to keep us going? Is this knowledge of who God as a father is. It's not whether we pay for you. It's not whether it's going to be comfortable there. It's not about any of those things. It's about we are going to represent our father. And when we get into the twang, now we are really going to trust and see our father who raises the dead. Are you okay? Paul starts off in verse 3, he says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You have to look at those wording and you have to underline them and you have to ask yourself the question, why is he speaking about the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ? And why doesn't he just say it's your Father? Why does he start off this in this time of incredible pressure? Why does he start off to say, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ? You know why? Because God doesn't want you to be uncertain about what Father he is. And so he's defining it. He's saying, listen, I want to make clear to you, I am the God and the Father of my Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because he's mindful that there's four kinds of fathers that will influence your life. And he doesn't want you to live from your reference point. He wants you to live from his reference point. Some of you, you never had a father. It's like, ooh, okay, thank you. I don't even know what this thing is about. Just give me Jesus, I'll be happy. This Holy Spirit stuff, yeah, okay. I'll put my toe in every other now and then, but just me and Jesus, you know. Some of you... You had an abusive father. He was ungodly. And now you get born again. And now that picture, that image is in your mind. Oh, I must come to a father, but he's going to abuse me. Some of you had godly fathers. You have to praise the Lord for them. Praise the Lord for them. They're not perfect, but they're godly. They say a no, they give you a no when you least want to have that no. They discipline you when you think just this oak is just such a prune. Can I say even a godly father that's done his best to love on you and to give you opportunities and to serve you and to mature you, even he pales in comparison to God as a father. In the natural, you will have two fathers, ungodly or godly. 
I'm not even talking. If you are without a father, you've got serious ground to make up this morning. But open your heart. Because God can do some incredible things with you this morning. In the spirit, there's two fathers as well. It's God the Father and the devil. Go read John chapter 8. When Jesus says to the Pharisees, your father is the devil. You see, every person that's not born again has the devil as his father. But, here's the good news. If you believe in Jesus, God becomes your father. You can, should get excited about that. But Paul defines, he says, I want you to make sure that your image of the Father is the image of the Father that Jesus, the Lord Christ, represents to you. I want to make sure you get this thing. Don't miss this thing. The Father we're coming to is not your reference point, is not your background, is not your failure, is not your perception of who He is. The Father you're coming to this morning is the Father that gets represented in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Are you happy? You see, God is so practical, friends. He's so practical. He knows that we're living in a fallen world. He knows that we're living in a messed up world. And so He sends His Son in the flesh to help you discover what your Heavenly Father is like. Now, if for a moment you think with me just quickly, what would you have to say, looking at the life of Jesus, God your Father must be like? God as a Father must be like. Just quickly, think with me. What does John 3, 16 says? For oh, God so loved the world that He did what? He held unto His Son. For God the Father loved the world so much that He gave His very best as a sacrifice for the whole world. Those who rejected Him, those who despise Him, those who want nothing to do with Him, He still did it. What does it tell you about your Father in heaven, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ? What does it tell you about that Father? He is loving, He is kind. And he's so generous. The reason you battle with generosity is because you do not know who your father is. The reason you battle to give is because you do not know who your father is. He's the Lord and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. John chapter 6. Jesus says, this, the work you need to do, the only thing you have to do this morning, is just believe in the one the Father has sent. That's all you need to do. Why? What happens if you believe that Jesus was sent by God as a Father? What happens? You get access to the Father. You get set right with Father. Jesus says in John chapter 6, 44, says this, he says, listen, what you need to know, that those who come to me, Jesus, they've been drawn by my Father. The fact that you are here this morning worshiping Jesus as the fa your Father in heaven, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, doing the drawing work on your heart, saying, come here, I want to show you that I'm a Father, I want to teach you about me, but for that you have to look at my practical representative. His name is Jesus. Are you Okay. Coming to a father that is ridiculously loving, far beyond your comprehension. Coming to a father that is ridiculously generous, far than what your limited, limited mind cannot perceive this morning. If you want to know who God is as a father, look at the life of Jesus. Jesus spared no expense. He endured every sacrifice. He says, I have to go and represent my father to them because their image of fathering is so skewed, is so messed up. If 
You recall the story in Luke 15, the parable of the, of, the, of the prodigal son. Have you read that story? Or have you heard that story preached somewhere? Who's never heard the story of the prodigal son? I don't want to read it this morning. There's stuff for us, good stuff for us to get into. I just want to reference that story because that defines your view of the father. There's three boys. The youngest, who's the rebellious son. All look at him and say, Skanda. Then you have the older boy. He's the responsible one. Remember that one? He does everything that he thinks his father wants. And he comes to his father and says, Father, you never give me anything. And then there's the one that tells a story. He's the available one, the willing one. What do I, what do, why am I telling you that story? The youngest boy has a view of his father that he doesn't want to associate with. He says, it's better for me to call it quits. I'm going to call like I'm dead, and you're dead to me. So what does he do? He's stuck in his pride. He's stuck in his rebellious pride. He doesn't want to yield his heart to his father so that his father can show him who he really is. What does the father do in that story? He still gives him his inheritance. But here's the point. Here's the point. If you are busy, if you are stuck in rebellious pride towards God as a father, you will always be busy with the things of the world. You're born again. Jesus saved you. The life of God's inside of you. But you're always busy with the things of the world. Why? Because you've got rebellious pride in your heart. You cannot see God as the father that you need him to see. Are you guys okay? The cheap seats, are you guys okay? You should be using the air condition at least. The older son, he's also stuck in pride, but he's got responsible pride. He's saying, I will do the things of God. I will do what he wants me to do, but he doesn't have the right view of his father and so what does he do? Because he's stuck in his responsible pride, he's always busy with religion. What must I do? How must I do it? Why don't you ever give me something? Have you not seen what I've done? Are you guys being helped this morning? The son that tells the story has got one intention in mind. I'm living in relationship with my father. What does the father say? He says, you've got access to me. He says to his religious boy, you've got access to me and everything that I have is yours. Do you know what it means to be righteous? You must have heard that somewhere in the base. Righteousness. Have you? If you're not, you must be visiting this morning. What does it mean to be righteous? What does it mean to have Christ's righteousness assigned to you? What does it mean? Please make a note. Righteousness equals... To have access to God as a father. And to have access to all that belongs to him. Some of our thinking is so poor. It's like, what are you talking about? Righteousness means this. You've got access to God as a father. And you've got Access to everything that belongs to him. How? Because of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to challenge your paradigm this morning. I want to challenge your thinking this morning. Are you busy with the God Father of our Lord Jesus Christ? Or are you busy with the God and Father of your own failings, past references and limitations? Because either you'll be busy with the world, or you'll be busy with religion, but you will not have the freedom that comes from relationship with God as a father. Your faith makes God's love very practical. Very practical. If you're battling to get your life of faith practical, it's because you do not know who God as a father is. Because if you get to connect with what he has, who he is, my friends, your life of faith becomes so simple, so practical. Are we okay? I suppose I can make an altar call now and close the meeting. Who's not challenged at this point?
Verse 20, Paul says this. He says, every promise that God has made is yes in Christ. Please hear, it's in Christ that the promises are yes. It's not in yourself, it's not in your flesh, it's not in your rebellion, it's not in your resistance. It's in Christ. The reason you died with Jesus is you died to the influence of your great, great, great grandfather, Adam, and now there's a new head over your life. And in Christ, every promise that God has made is yes. Now, there's a nice Bible study for you this week. Go seek out the promises, Armanus. What are all the promises that God has made? And here's your conclusion. Yes, you can have them. I'm not going to hold anything back. Why? Because you're in Christ. And by faith, you positioned yourself there. And I cannot say no to my son, Jesus Christ, who's done every sacrifice to represent me well. What do you think God the Father does when the Son, Jesus Christ, comes to him and says, Father, you know what, I have this request of you, Father. I just want to figure out, Father, I mean, would you even consider this, Father? You know, I, you know this thing, you know, the, the budget. Yes, Father, my budget really is pinched. I mean, January seems to never stop. It feels like a year in itself. Father, just, you know, can you even consider? What do you think God the Father will do to a son, his son, that went through every sacrifice to please him? You see, in your mind, you're thinking, I think the Father will say, yeah, you know, let's just, let's just think about it a little bit, my boy. You know, let's just talk about your stewardship a little bit. Well, you know, you know, just tell me, what are you going to do with this? What do you think God the Father will be responding to in His Son when His Son comes and asks, Father, this thing. Come help me. Yes. My boy, why are you even asking? My boy, after what you've done, after your willingness to, to die and give yourself away, my boy, you just go for it, my boy. So why don't you think like that? You know why? Because you're not in Christ, you're in your flesh, you're in your opinions, you're in your pride. God says, I will be your source. How? In Christ. When you approach God as a father through Christ, God will not deny you. Is that too much faith? Your health. God says, I want to heal you. I have actually healed you when Jesus died on the cross. I have healed you. So, Father, can I have that healing? I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's just really consider that carefully. Have you seen how you've eaten Malfa puddings? <laughs> now, you know, I, I just don't know, my boy. I have to teach you a lesson here. God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ says, yes. To every promise that is in Christ. I get it that you need some stewardship. I get it that you need to pull up your socks and how you budget. I get all those things. But it has to come as an outflow from knowing that I'm doing this because he's already said yes to more. Amen. Whose mind am I battling right now? Who's challenged? Thank you. Thank you for being honest at least. You see, when you come in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, you come based on everything that Jesus has done before the Father. How? By faith. Father, it doesn't make sense. I don't know how this thing is going to work. I don't know this. I don't know that. Father says, just come. Because you're asking in Jesus Christ's name, I cannot say no. So the issue is, are you in faith? Not whether God will give the yes, it's whether you are in faith. So you have to fight the fight of faith to come to God as a father in which you have the yes already in Christ. This is ongemakkelijk for
He's going on to live a life of unbelief and go to God. Oh, where was God? Where was God? Where was God? God says, where do you think I was? I was on the cross representing you. I'm making myself practically available to you. I'm faithful. But the accusations in your heart limits you from walking with me. I wanna, I've already given you success. I've already given you uh, 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 the promises. I've already given you blessing. I've already, but you need faith to come to me and receive the yes. Some of you come to God as a father with a yes and no argument. Yes and no. Yes and no. Yes and no. I wonder what mood he's in today. Which food did he get out of bed in? Maybe today is going to be a no. So let me rather not disturb him too much. The power to raise the dead. Yes, in Christ. Yes, go. The power or the ability to live and rest so much peace. That promise is yes. But not in yourself, not in your flesh, not in the world, not in your rebellion, just in Christ. Get your faith into who Jesus is for you and then receive the blessing. I'm not preaching prosperity, I'm preaching faith. You see, we have this poverty mindset that thinks God doesn't want to bless me. I mean, I've trusted him for this, I've done all that, and I've done all this, and I've done all that. The problem with this is what all, everything that you have done. But when you turn by faith and say, Jesus, because of what you've done, I receive. I mean, I'd love to chase a rabbit here, but let me not. Your success, your prosperity, your healing, your holiness, your righteousness, your rulership, your rest. Go look for the promises. God says it's yes. What do you learn about God as a father? He's faithful. He is so faithful. He's made a promise. And he delivered on it. How do you know it? Look at his son Jesus. He said, I will save you from your sin. You can't do it yourself. Let me. Let me take you out of darkness, out of the control of darkness. Let me take you out. In Christ, I will will redeem you. I will buy you with blood. And I'll wash all your sins of this camp. In Christ, by faith. Some of you saying, Yannis, no, no, we're going way too deep this morning. Just tell us about Jesus. I'm trying to. <laughs> Jesus is the manifestation of the faithfulness of God. But at some point in your personal friendship with Jesus, Jesus says he will start to teach you about God the Father himself. And when you know that, you will not ask Jesus, you will ask God the Father for what it is that he has in his heart over your life. Some of us hit a religious ceiling. Jesus, 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 please hear me. I'm all for Jesus. I love Jesus passionately. I cry in his presence because of how much he loves me. The depths of what he's gone through to just show that love. But Jesus came to demonstrate the reality of a father that loves, that he wants to settle you. He wants to love you. He wants to help you understand that you are a son of God. Some of you, you don't need your iPhone. You're just distracted at the moment. Focus. This word will change your life. Verse 20. Hey. Look to this. It says, For no matter, no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ, and so through Him, The amen, underlined in your Bible, the amen is spoken by who? Us. Not heaven. It's not heaven saying amen, 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 Lord, you've blessed it. Amen, 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 amen. No, no, no. Heaven sees. Who is giving the amen? Let's try again, the side of the church. Who is giving the amen? Oh my goodness. 
this, guy, this side got it. Let's try this side. Who is giving the amen? Ah. Oh. Has the middle row got anything to say about the matter? Who's the responsibility with? What is your responsibility? To say, Amen. It is so. Let it be so. As you've promised, my response is, Amen. Everything, Amen. Not something, Amen. Can I give you a key that will change your life? That will open doors to you in the spirit like you cannot believe. Stop thinking, amen. Start speaking, amen. I mean, some of you are really holy brothers and sisters in the Lord. I can see it by your posture this morning. Sorry, right upright figure. Let's praise the Lord. Your amen means nothing mentally. But your amen unlocks things in the spirit when it's given verbally. It's time for you to get out of silence and into sound. What's the sound you need to make? Oh my Lord Jesus, thank you. Revival has come to the base. They're getting it. Father, they're getting it. It's not what you think. It's what you speak. The enemy wants to keep you in the mental realm. Thinking, 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 because he knows he's been defeated. And he knows he needs authority again to see if he can access. So what does he do? He bombards you with the lies. He bombards you with the fears. He bombards you with all the stuff in your mind that keeps you busy and that keeps you thinking, oh, I wonder how, I wonder how, I wonder how, I wonder how. Why? Because he's still in charge of the natural realm. Though he's been defeated. But if you can simply say this word, Amen. What happens? You're linking up with God's truth and you start to move in the spirit realm. The enemy is so afraid of you discovering your voice. Hoy, Papa. You don't even have to have Isaiah 43 quoted by heart. You just need to say, Amen. Let it be so, Lord. All the promises, every promise you have made, Amen. Why? Because God, your Father, is respectful. He's full of respect for you. He gave you a free choice. He never forces you. He never pressures you. He never puts on you any condemnation or demand. He says, my son, if you don't walk in agreement, I'm going to respect your opinion on this matter. Why? I love you so much, my son. I will never force myself on you. You see, you do not know how gentle your father in heaven is. You don't know. You just don't know. When stuff goes wrong in your life, you find yourself under pressure, the first thing you do is like, where were you? He says, I'm, I'm right here, my son, but I need your agreement For the blessing to be released. I need your agreement because I'm not going to violate you. I'm not an abusive father. You can praise him. Why do we battle to get this agreement? Why do we battle to get the amen out? Paul says it's because in your mind you still see God as the enemy. You still think, oh, I don't know, this old fellow today, you know. I don't know. Why do you battle to get this agreement from your heart? It's because you set certain limitations. 
And you say, no, 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 no. You do not know what I've been through. And I probably don't, you're right. But can I tell you, every one of those past failures and pains was designed by Satan as a father over this world. Stop accusing God as your father. You okay? Your faith has to speak the amen. You have to teach your kids to speak their own amen. If you're a good father, that's the only thing you're about to get right. If you just get your kids to understand God as a father, and they have to learn to speak their amen. My friend, you have set your kids up for an incredible inheritance. Hey. Not about the school you get them into. It's not about the varsity you get them into. It's not how you control their friendship circles. It's none of those. Teach them their agreement with God and God himself will sort them out. How? By faith. You say that, amen. How do you feel? That all the promises of heaven. Yes, 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 yes. Don't even ask yes. How do you feel? I'm like, amen. What joy, Father. I know it doesn't look it. I know it doesn't feel it. I know it doesn't make any sense. But amen. amen. How? By faith. Yeah, hey, Janice, but I don't feel healed. I mean, I've, I know you don't feel and you don't look healed either. I promise you. But in Christ, your healing is yes. It's waiting for your Amen. Verse 21. It says, Now it is God, the Father, who makes us both, us and you. Listen, this is Paul speaking, a mighty apostle. He said, How do I get to stand firm? And how do you get to stand firm? It says, God, the Father, who makes us and you stand firm in Christ. I love how the the Amplified Bible says this, it is God the Father who establishes and confirms you through fellowship with Christ. How does God get you to stand firm? He establishes you, Danny, in Christ, and then He confirms you in Christ. How? Through fellowship. Through fellowship. See, we don't know how relational our Father is. We do not know that every morning when you get up, He's been expectantly, He's been up before you, expectantly watching for you just to come and engage with Him. You know why some of us battle in our identity in Christ, who we are in Christ, as we do not know how to fellowship with God as a Father. He says, I will establish you, I will confirm you. How? As you start to talk with the Father, but what? About Jesus. The word fellowship is the word koinonia. It means to have a common benefit, but it also means to have a common good, to have a common interest. What do you think God the Father is very interested about? It's like the deep feeling. Let's go. You okay? What do you think God the Father would love to talk to you about? My son, why? Man, have you seen the father's boy? Have you seen what that boy has done? What do you think the father wants to talk to you about? 
not your snotty nose and oh, he wants to come, he wants you to come and say, Father, can we talk about your boy a little bit this morning? Father, I've got precious. I mean, I need to know the Bible. I need, but Father, I want to come because we have a common interest to you and me now, Father. His name is Jesus. Father, let's talk about Jesus a little bit. Well, he's fully God, but he was fully man. Father, how did he get it right on this earth to live as a man? Father says, I've been waiting for that conversation. You know why? Because now, my son, I can establish you as a son. Now, my son, now that you're asking the right questions, my son, I can confirm you, my son. Let's quickly stand, just real quick. Don't want to miss this. Then you can sit again. Just, oh, you want to do a little bit of yoga? <laughs> so, this is the church. That's the monk. Just start to move a little bit. Let it flow to your brain. I have you to hear this. I'd hate to come and call you out because you're sleeping in church. <laughs> Grab a seat again. Let me just say, yoga is demonic. You open yourself up to all sorts of demonic stuff. If you're busy with it, stop it. Just go for a walk with the Lord. It'll be far better for your body. How do you get this, my friends? God the Father wants to establish you. You know what he establish means? It's to secure your position. I wonder how many of you this morning thinking, yeah, you know, I don't know, I believe in Jesus, but I'm going to make it into heaven. I, I don't know. Don't raise your hand. Some days, am I, I know, man, I, it's been a, I knocked heaven's attention. I was incredibly good. Other days you wake up and before you get on the port hitter, you've sworn at 10 taxis. Like, oh, yeah, today I lost it again. God says, when you come to fellowship with me and what we have in common, my son Jesus Christ, I will establish you. You'll never be uncertain again. He says, I will come and I will confirm you. Oh, I love this bit. You know how God confirmed us? By sending His Spirit to witness on your behalf. Yeah, yeah, like I. When everybody is fighting and everybody is screaming and everybody is going bonkers, you just sit, you fellowship with God, your Father, he says, my boy, not your battle. Just get out of the way so I can move. I will confirm you by my Spirit. You have to get that your father is so relational. He's so relational. Stop talking about your needs. He knows, Danny, what your needs are. He knows what your questions are. Do you know God doesn't have a single question in his mind? He had it all figured out. Because he's God. Come, fellowship. Father, let's talk about Jesus a little bit here. Teach me. Talk to me. Some of you that battle to hear the Lord, like, how do I get that right? Try tomorrow morning. Or try this afternoon before, or after your afternoon nap. Because I see some of you enjoy your afternoon nap. You're starting early in church already. After your afternoon nap, just close your door. Say, Father, this preacher spoke about these things. But can we talk about Jesus? What do we have in common? See how you will start to hear the voice of God. How much more? It's the question. Verse 21. You're going to like this one. It says in the NIV, He anointed us. Underline that. Come Ali Buddha. Ali Buddha. All the conservative mindedness. He anointed us. Underline. In your Bible, if you don't have repent, bring it with next week with a highlighter, anointed us. You know what it means to be anointed? It's when you take the mic and you shake. Maybe. But that's not the full picture. Anointed is simply this, to be empowered with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Ooh, no, it's a paar good to 
No, no, no. The Holy Spirit and the manifestations of the Spirit are okay. Okay. Well, I think we're visiting at the base, but I don't think we're coming back because they speak about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Next week we're back in religion. God the Father wants to empower you with every single gift that can manifest through the Spirit into your life. God is for wisdom. Would you agree? Yes. How do you access that wisdom? We pray, we sit, we wait. Okay. Somewhere along the line, I think the, the, the wisdom will deposit. He says, no, 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 no. You do not understand how resourceful I am. My wisdom will come to you through a gift of wisdom, a gift of knowledge, or a gift of the sin, the spirits. You do not know how. You ask, he'll give you the gift. All of a sudden, with clarity, you know what decision to make in the gift of wisdom. Why? You've accessed God's mind that's outside of time. You go with the solution, your partner says, no, 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 no. Like, okay, good luck, let's see. Gift of knowledge is when you tap into God's secret wisdom, the wisdom especially that's, that's hidden in his heart, in the hearts of men. Oh, I like that. You know, I know nothing about you, sir. I know, did this quite a thing the first time with the base this morning? Second time? Third time? Close. I know nothing about him. But Father, would you flow through the knowledge of the secrets of his heart? Would you flow to me this morning? What do you see over this man? What's your name, sir? Keith. Steve. What's your name, sir? Steve and surname? Voost. Do you have Afrikaans? There's Voost in the Voost around. Father, I ask for the secrets of this man's heart to be revealed. I don't have it, but you give it. Father, I just come and I thank you for places he's been so disillusioned. There were days he used to be on fire. But those days are far gone. I see that in your heart. There's a small little flame flickering still. You're upright. You love the Lord. You want to serve the Lord. But the desire has been affected. Is that any... Any word of a truth? Am I making up stories here? Is it the truth? How do I know that? Eee. We have an anointed man on a chest, but do you know that God has anointed you for the secrets of men's hearts? So I want you to just open your heart. Just open your heart. Open your heart. That's it. Good relax. You can close your eyes. I'm not going to smack you. Holy Spirit, come. Just a fire. A fresh, a fresh. He's yearning, he's longing. Your simple response is amen. Holy Spirit, thank you that you ignite a fire in this man like he's never seen. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. How do you feel, Mr. Voost? Steve, how do you feel? Much better. It's a relief. Amen. I didn't get the detail of everything where Steve was disappointed or disillusioned. I didn't get that. Why? Because God honors him as well. So God speaks into the essence. But knowledge can become very specific, very clear. Yes, I'm spending way too much time on us. Is it helping us? Yes. You know that your father is a God of power. You know that? Amen. How does he give you that power? He released some of the doing gifts to you of the Spirit. A gift of faith to say, oh, I'm not working with me, I'm working with God. It's him that's going to deal this thing. Yes. Gifts of healing is his power. Yes. Healing is a process. The impact is instant, but the healing takes time to manifest. Gifts of power. It's miracles. It's when you deliver demons and you lay hands on someone and they go, whoa. What is that? God's power. What's happened? A miracle's just happened in your midst. Because the power of God did something to bring freedom to people. Can I be honest? Who am I messing with now? Who's reluctant for these things I'm talking about? Be honest, you're in church. Just raise your hand. 
Be honest. It's going to judge you. We're going to build your faith and teach you. God's word, God still speaks His voice. What are these gifts about? Gifts of speaking, praying in tongues, prophesying, interpreting tongues. God empowers you with His Spirit. Over here. So God, your Father, is resourceful. He wants to meet all your needs, not in heaven, here on earth. And He empowers you with His Holy Spirit. When you start to have conversations about Jesus, He will give you His wisdom. He will give you His power. He will give you His words to speak. If the gifts are not manifesting when we're together, friends, we have to ask ourselves, are we still alive? Verse 22 says, It's the Father who sets His seal of ownership on us. This is beautiful. How did the Father mark you? When the Father took you out of the kingdom of darkness, how did He mark you? What is the mark that's on your life that's visible in the invisible world? It's the blood of Jesus primarily. He was so happy to put the mark of blood on you. Because you carry the blood, you can give the mark of His Holy Spirit. You okay? So whenever you walk in the natural world, the spirit world is looking at you and thinking, whoa, I can't touch this blood there. He's marked. He belongs to God as a father. He belongs as a son. He's marked. So let's keep them occupied so that they don't know that they now have the Spirit of God. The blood marks you so that the Spirit can come and rest on you. Now there's joy. Do you know what you discover about God as a Father? When He marks you with the blood and He marks you with the Spirit? He's boastful. Come now. Dads, think with me a little bit quick. I mean, you always dreamt that your boy will be a springbok. Come now, we're in the West Strand, isn't it? Cannot fathom that he would do anything else than play for the springboks. So when he scores his first try for the under 9A team, well, let's make it better for the sake of contrast. For the under 9D team, what do you do? I want to tell you about that boy of mine. I want to tell you, that man in his first match, he scored three tries. Never mind that they played against no opposition at what a shadow match. My boy. That guy is going into great heights. What is the father doing? He's boasting. He's boasting. Oh, Wow. I know, man, he's going to get a contract with Russi. I will be surprised if they don't phone him by the age of 14 already. <laughs> Natural fathers come now. What does the father do? When he marks you with the blood, when he marks you with the spirit, what do you think he's doing towards Al? <laughs> Woo! My boy, key. He just started off Sunday morning. He confessed and that he believed in Jesus. My boy, Key, is destined for great things. If heaven has a Springbok team, he's in there. Have you ever felt how it feels like when God the Father boasts over your life? Have you? Not because you've done anything great yet. <laughs> Simply because he's so proud that you responded to Jesus. And he knows what's waiting. Hey, I'm messing with some minds this morning. That's my boy. He carries my mark. It's the blood of my son on him. It's my spirit on him. Watch him. Watch him. Careful how. Watch him. 
So what does hell do? Woo, we heard that. Let's see how we can put him down. How we can take her down before she realized that she's been mocked. She's been destined for greatness. Do we serve the same father? Do we access the same father this morning? Or is your father different? Some of you are really thinking about this, and I'm happy. Last one. Say, praise God. It's the last one. I love this. He has put the Spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing was to come. I love how the Amplified says it's the Father, the Father's approval. No, sorry. The Father gave you the Holy Spirit, but just a mark, as a deposit in your heart. What's the deposit about? It's about the promise, I've got eternal life for you. The promise of the Father is that He's given you the deposit of His Spirit into your heart. Into your heart. What is that deposit about? My son, you have eternal life. You have eternal life. You have eternal life. You have eternal life. You have the life of God that stretches for eternity. It can never run out. Never. Never. That life is authoritative. It's disease healing. It is atmosphere shifting. That life is promised to you. It's waiting for you. How do you know it? The Spirit is in my heart. You know what you discover about God if you look at this truth? God as a father is playful. He says, my boy, I've given you something that's indestructible. Let's go play. That peace you have in your heart, all you need, let's go. Nothing will come against that life. Nothing will withhold you. Nothing will keep you. And if you make a mistake, don't you worry, my boy. Let's just go. Do you know God is a playful father? Some of you don't because you never had a father like that. For them it was work, 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 work. Okay, no Sunday, work, work, work. God is playful. He says, I've given you something that is so powerful, so indestructible. Let's go play, my boy. Will you make some mistakes? Hey, my boy, I'm so excited to find you in those places because I'm going to teach you something about Jesus. Will you run into suffering? My boy, I'm not going to tell you in the front end, but there's a little bit of that waiting. I didn't cause it, by the way, my boy. Didn't cause it. I didn't cause the hardships, my boy. But when you get there and you bump into the hardships, you bump into the confrontation, my boy, everything that Christ has suffered... Christ is comforted in. So my boy, don't you worry about hardships. Don't you worry about suffering. When you bump into them, I'm going to comfort you, my boy. I'm going to give you peace. Let's go play. Amen? Flight, flight. Let's do it as I want you to stand with me. Ask the band to come join me. Friends, you might have forgotten everything I said this morning. There's one thing I want you to remember. Guess what? Amen. Ah. <laughs> Seems like there's one brother in our midst that's got that thing. I want to minister this morning real quick. We don't have a lot of time. But I felt the Lord say to address generational curses. Because generational curses gets imprinted on you through a father, an earthly father. 
and it, and, it, and it deals with your ability to receive from your heavenly Father. So this morning, if there's anything that I said this morning, and you're like, oh my goodness, I didn't know God is my Father, I want you to raise your hands right now. I want to pray over you. I'm not going to call you to the front. We don't have time for that. But if you can receive in your seat where you're standing this morning, the Lord will do something incredible with your life. If you can recognize this morning, I've got a poverty mind. My mind is limited. I don't see God like that. Then you should be raising your hands right now. Paul starts this letter off in 1 Corinthians. He says, you remain unchanged because you do not know how to use your faith. Some of you, you're coming to this meeting and you're going to go home exactly the same. Because you have to activate your faith this morning. I ask again, if God the Father is a foreign concept to you or your mind is limited in any way, I don't care how long you've walked with Him, I don't care how long, how much God is usually in ministry, I love all those things. I want you just to raise your hands real quick. Father, this morning I come and I bind the cause and the effect of generational influences that has limited us from enjoying God as a father. I bind the cause and I bind the effect. In Jesus' name. Now, if you have an earthly father that has harmed you, you choose to forgive him. Don't think and speak it. Say, Father, I choose to forgive my parents. I choose to forgive my dad. Just do that real quick. Some of you, you need to ask God for forgiveness because you've accused Him. He's taken your father. Well, that's your idea. Your, God has taken your father. You don't know the works of the enemy. And so because you grew up without a father, you don't have a concept for the father. Come this morning and just say, Father, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, I ask you to forgive me. That's it. Wonderful done that I know your hands gets heavy you can just let your uh, put your hands down we're not finished we're nearly there close your eyes with me again I want to help you to find your position in Christ close your eyes with me please please use your imagination in this moment the Bible says that Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of God the Father I want you to, with your imagination and faith, see yourself seated on a massive chair. And to your left, God the Father is seated. To your left, you can't see His face. You might not be able to see His being, but you are aware that to the left of you, there's there's divine, divine life, presence, peace. I'm going to help you how to receive from your Father. Father, I come this morning and I take authority over blockages that has impacted our spiritual sight. I take authority over blockages that has impacted our spiritual ears. I take authority over, over things that has impacted our spiritual feelings, our spiritual touch. Things that has affected our spiritual smell. Things that has affected our spiritual taste this morning. I take authority over those things. I bind them, the cause and the effect of them. I cast them out. Go! In Jesus' name. Thank you. Now you can receive. Let him speak to you. Let him give you pictures. You can hear his word. You can feel him. You can taste him. You can smell him. How do you, re how do you release? How do you release that faith? I taught you this morning. 
Amen. Amen. On the count of three, can we give one amen? One, two, three. Amen.